Uh, welcoming our first lightning speaker of um, the final lightning talk session, uh, Fernando uh, Masanori. Hi, folks. I am professor and I have a MOOC. Uh, this talk is the, the end of the talk I gave at the Python Education Summit. If you like, bit.ul slash python dash for dash for zombies. As a professor, all we need to improve our examples. The car is improving, the TV is improving, but the programming class no, uh, is the same. Sorry about that. The programming class is the same today because as a professor, sometimes I, I, we have the same way to teach of, <laughs> as three years ago. There are few codes that are not my codes. My codes is uh, the 12 years and girl codes I will show you. We begin we have a simple guest number, and what's the best guess? Twelve. No, forty-two. <laughs> From Handel, import hand inch. What's the probability? Two. How many 42 numbers will show you? All this. <laughs> the cool thing in Python, Python is uh, open source. And we have the choice to hack it. <laughs> But the awesome thing is the one little girl. Uh, uh, I told you some um, changed my guess the number uh, program to guess the names with the same logic. It's not my code. It's 12 years old. Lady coach. Works the same. The other cool coach I will show you is a simple crypto Caesar algorithm. It's a simple. Pile is awesome. Okay, it's a simple. But this young lady changed my code I teach. I'm show a cool thing. It's Chinese. <laughs> This is not my coat. It's a 12 years old lady coat. One hard thing to teach is object orienting programming. What's the result? Of course. <laughs> 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 
I have modified the class integer to return OK. The other code, the last, I will show you. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you. OK, so uh, we have uh, Jordi um, on deck, and we have um, Giannis Lydell setting up over here. And uh, I'd like, let's welcome uh, Tim Hatch to uh, speak to us about regular expressions. Hello, uh, my name is Tim Hatch. I'm an SRE for Google. And one of the things that I get handed a lot is a regular expression that's meant to match a list of things. They're fairly simplistic, no dot stars or anything like that. And as a human, you can figure out what they mean pretty quickly, but we wanted to code that up. So Alex Perry and I wrote a module called SRE Yield that you give it a regular expression, and it will return you the list of matches. So here you can see that this thing matches five strings. Here are the actual strings. And it turns out that we can do fairly fast set membership checks because, well, you gave it a regular expression, and we just match against that. Um, after coming up with the module, we actually found that there's a, another use for it. Randall Monroe gave us a list of things that match substrings of president's names as basically bigraphs, and we can use it to expand that to, to start on. It also lets you, let's see, here's a more complicated example. So this generates a bunch of binary strings, and this one over here matches double-coded strings with um, an approximation of proper escaping in there. However, we can't get the length. It turns out that Python tries to take the result of the len function and turn it into a platform integer. So it turns out you can call underscore len directly, and that's a big number. You can see the first few matches, although it looks like several of them are the same. That's because dot matches non-printing characters. We can see this is uh, behaving somewhat like a match object for regular uh, the RE module. And you can get various groups. We can run it on dot star. Again, too many matches. But this is the actual number of matches for dot star. If we make an assumption that star only means 64K worth of repetitions. So we actually hard coded this because it worked fine on Alex's computer which used a 16-bit repetition count uh, where the maximum unsigned int means infinite. Uh, I ran it on my computer, which used a 32-bit count, and it just sat there forever. So we actually hard-coded it in the module to be 16-bit. You can see with RE debug uh, that this one's 32-bit as well. And just to show how massive these get and why we have to do all of this calculation lazily, uh, and the code's open source, by the way. You're free to check it out. Uh, there are 157,000 decimal digits in the number of matches. And that number takes 65 kilobytes to represent. If we run the next one, we're at 473,000 decimal digits. And actually, only about double the number of bytes. Uh, and then we can run it for another one, which takes a bit even just to figure out how many matches there are. Not the matches themselves, but how many there are. Uh, aside, when testing this, I found that enabling parallel processing in nodes actually slowed it down because it had to pickle all these giant numbers and pass them to the other process and unpickle, and it was, it was actually faster just to do it in a single process. So for uh, repetitions, you're basically doing base conversion. You have something that has like five possible matches and you want you know, some number of these. You're just doing repeated modulus and divide. So I had to come up with a module called FastDivMod to actually make this possible in a reasonable amount of time. So here's an example of what it returns. It's just a, an iterator. Um, this is how, it, how long it takes using an explicit modulus and a divide. And I'm going to tell you that we can do this twice as fast with a standard library by using DivMod. Does anybody know off the top of your head why it's twice as fast? Because it says in the source that it does div mod and then throws one answer away when you call either divide or modulus. So by doing div mod at once, it's twice as fast. Using fast div mod, it's the same speed. And this is because fast div mod doesn't take effect until it actually has about 1,000 uh, iterations in a chunk. 
So you can see this only had 185 iterations. Um, it wasn't worth it to optimize past that. So here we have an even bigger one. This one's, uh, what's that, 100,000 iterations. And you can see it takes about two seconds with div mod, and it takes 0.06 seconds with fast div mod. 29 times faster. OK, last thing, because I'm going to run out of time. I also work on pigments. We got a bunch of pull requests for new lexers. I'll be around for sprints if you want to submit a new lexer. I decided someday that I was going to write a script to automate checking these lexers. And then I, I was like, it's going to take me a day. And then it took me six weeks. But it's, it's working now. And so if you, if you give it a regular expression, it parses it. And then it's able to tell you, oh, it looks like you did something silly here. You might want to check this out. And I get 10 seconds. And the most useful thing is that long Unicode is actually represented as surrogate pairs and does silly things with repetitions. We had three lectures that had this problem, and I'm out of time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Tim. OK, uh, a couple uh, quick announcements we have. Um, we're still looking for Justin Meyer and Andrew Francis. So uh, please come up and, and see Mike in the front uh, if you're here. Um, so on deck, we have uh, Greg Wilson. And uh, setting up over here, we have Jordi. But, uh, Please join me in welcoming uh, Giannis Lydell, who's going to be talking to us about Django settings. OK. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, probably a pretty specific problem, I guess. Uh, just to check, uh, who has used Django before? OK, that's great. Who hates Django settings? Oh, yes. OK, just for the others who hasn't actually worked with um, with Django. Uh, Django settings is basically a Python module with a bunch of globals uh, with uh, uppercase name. It's really annoying. I mean, in this case, for example, oh, wait, that's actually not the one that I wanted to show. Sorry. Um, this case is, um, is the um, settings file for, of the project that I work at Mozilla. It's uh, basically a huge, you know, it's a long file with tons of configuration files. It's just annoying. And what I figured, um, I wanted to fix this, but I can't really fix it inside of Django without breaking lo lots of code um, like that is out there. I, I wrote a, like a replacement or like an addition, basically. Um, in, better, in other words, it's actually a bridge between the way how Django handles settings uh, on those modules. Um, the, the basic idea is that instead of having all those globals in the settings, uh, actually put them, you know, providing a class that you can inherit from and have multiple, you know, kind of configurations, you know, some of those um, you know, uh, use cases would be, for example, that you have a base class that, that you can define some basic configuration um, values. But also, um, of course, you can have, you know, depending, depending on the environment you run uh, Django in, you can have different kinds of classes. I heard earlier that inheritance is supposed to be like ruled uncool, so I need to double check. Anyways. Um, this is old code, so I, mean, I apologize. Um, you actually, how, um, how you use settings usually with Django is to set an environment variable called Django settings module to define which module is um, supposed to be the truth of, of configuration. Uh, what my additional app, Django configuration, does is it adds another one called Django configuration, um, which defines which class of that module to load in the first place. So it's a convenient uh, you know, ability to uh, switch between configurations uh, depending on what you want. And with um, you know, recent web hosting stories, that's easy to do and re easy to switch. Um, there's also a convenient um, command line option for the manage.py, which is for all those that don't know Django, the way how you usually interact with the, with the, uh, with the system. Um, and you know the, the basic idea behind it is that, and that's why I'm kind of giving this here at PyCon, is that it applies that the content of that class to the to the actually the module that is it, uh, you know that it's actually written in. So it's a huge hack, but it's actually using an official standard. So I'm cool. I mean, um, it uses an import hack to to work around the the you know the oddities of Django's own system in many ways. Um, yeah, um, you can you know go crazy and write properties. Wow, uh, it's like a big deal for settings. Um, you know, extend a certain uh, other like uh, language settings that are already there. You can you know use mix-ins and a couple of other like um, you know program pa programming patterns. Um, one of uh, one of those that I actually want to go a little bit more in de into detail, so-called the values. Um, it's basically a way how to 
define configuration values um, that uh, allow to use the so-called 12-factor methodology. If you haven't heard of it, you should look into it. It's great for service-oriented web, um, uh, service-oriented architectures and web development. So it's, it's awesome. It's, um, specifically, it ha I ship basically a couple of uh, predefined values that have like all the custom, uh, all the like the default um, uh, data types. And you can use this in specifically, you know, by defining, you know, instantiating such a value class, defining it into this um, class level um, attribute, and there you go. And then the cool thing, it automatically allows you to overwrite those uh, settings depending on the environment as well. It works with the um, like community standards such as like the database value, for example. You just overwrite it depending on what you want to have, for example, a different database uh, on your production server, and that's it. Thank you, Giannis. Um, so on deck, we have uh, Jeff Armstrong, just uh, to be uh, ready to set up when Jordi is done. Uh, setting up here, we have uh, Greg Wilson. And at the moment, uh, we have uh, Jordi talking, us, uh, talking to us about RevSets in Mercurial. Thank you. Okay, so I want to show you a feature of Mercurial that is actually, I think, really cool. It's a way to query your history. So I actually work on the Octave repository. Uh, it's a free MATLAB clone. And let's look around here. So we're in the Octave repository. Let's look at what the branches that we have. There's three branches. I also have some bookmarks running around. Here are uh, two important bookmarks, the Geordi bookmark in which I'm currently standing, and the add bookmark. This looks like this in the log. The Jordi bookmark is right here. It's two ahead of the at bookmark. The at bookmark is upstream. So I've got two commits here that are not really ready to be pushed yet, but are in my local repository. So um, there are many ways to refer to a commit. I can refer to it by bookmark, or I can refer to it by its revision number, or I can refer to it by its hash. Uh, the revision number and the hash are right here. I can also refer to it by the tag that's there, tip. Or I can refer to it by negative revision numbers. These are just like indexing in Python arrays. They start from, from the back. So the ne negative one is the last one. Negative two is the next to last one. Um, now, there are more advanced ways to refer to commits. You can do ranges. That gives me the last two. Or you can do special syntax, like the dot, which means the current commit, the currently checked out commit. I'm standing on that right now. Um, there are two more ways you can refer to commits. That tilde one refers to the first ancestor, and the dot hat refers to the first parent. Now, if you're used to git, you probably have seen this syntax, and you probably, it looks something like, this right here. There's the little at syntax, hat syntax, and there's other examples here. But Mercurial ref sets are far more rich than just the git revision syntax. Mercurial ref sets actually are a functional language for selecting a set of revisions. And functional, they really mean functions. For example, we have all these functions, ancestors, author, bisect, children. And let's see a few of these examples of what these functions can do. So the last example with a dot hat could also be done with a p1 function, first parent. It's just alternate syntax, but there are more things. You can, for example, use the descendants function of the at. This gives me all the commits between the at and, all, and everything that follows, which is just two more commits. But you know what? I didn't actually really want the at, so I can use this language to say the descendants of the at and not the at. This is the language here. And this gives me the same thing as before, the last, last two commits, but omitting the one that I didn't want. And there are more examples. We can also take the minimum revision number of these. It's going to be this one right here. It's 6.2 instead of 6.3. And we can get them in a different order, reverse the order. Now, anywhere where we can use com uh, revision revision numbers, we can also use ref sets. So for example, if we want to just edit all the children of the at, which is my two commits, 
So this is just like git rebase dash i, hist edit. This is just small syntax for choosing the two commits that follow the upstream. Not actually going to edit, just going to show you what, uh, that it can be done. Another more interesting example is um, we are telling the bisect command to skip all the commits that do not touch this file. So if you want to bisect and you know your problem is only within one file, you can use something like this. Um, again, we're not actually going to bisect, just going to show you that it can be done. Right now, Mercurial it was marking the commits for bisection. Another example here, I'm going to go to the Mercurial source. And this one's more complicated, so let's look at it slowly. Here we have all the commits that add this file, histedit.py. We want the descendants of those commits. We want them to be tagged, and we want to, be, to get the minimum. What this is going to give me is the least tagged commit after this file was added. That, that is, the, the revision in which this file, um, th this feature got into Mercurial. Now, commits, uh, Mercurial is just a Python library, so you can write your own commits, I mean, your own ref sets. And let's see what this one does. I'm going to enable it. I'm going to go to here, and I'm going to get all the lousy numbers. Thank you. We've Two, three, five, seven, eleven. Prime numbers. Thank you, Jordan. Okay. So we have uh, Kurt Griffith setting up. We have, uh, sorry, we have Kurt Griffith on deck. We have Jeff Armstrong setting up over here. And um, right now, please join me in welcoming Greg Wilson. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Good. Were you at PyCon four years ago? Put your hands in the air. Okay. I broke a promise to my wife at PyCon in Atlanta. I started a new project. Yeah. So I used to teach software design and software engineering and things like that at the University of Toronto and elsewhere, and it was really frustrating because we'd say, okay, write me a five-page program. Now go work on a 150,000-line application at the bank. Good luck. Right? Architects learn how to do architecture by looking at blueprints, by looking at each other's buildings. How many of you are musicians? Put a hand in the air. How many songs have you played before you try to write your first song yourself? Yeah. How many of you graduated from university having read programs bigger than the ones you'd written yourself? Yeah, doesn't, yeah, okay, that was not a lot of hands. So we decided we're gonna fix that because ego has never been my problem. We started this project, the Architecture of Open Source Applications. It is at aosabook.org. What we did was get 50 different open source projects to give us chapter length descriptions of the architecture of their software. There's a chapter in here on how SendMail works. How many of you have ever had to configure SendMail? How many of you have done that without using bad language? Okay, in this book, Eric Allman explains why it has to be just as awful as it is. It's your fault, okay? <laughs> I'm not making that up. In here, you want to know how the LLVM compiler suite works? We've got it down to 20 pages. You want to understand the internals of a version control system? We have both Mercurial and Git. God, I love Mercurial. The more I learn about Git, the more I like Mercurial, okay? <laughs> Last year, oh no, wait, wait, it gets better. So last year, Tavish Armstrong. Tavish, are you in the audience? He's right in the back, ladies and gentlemen. As an undergraduate at Concordia University, he somehow managed to find time to put together volume three, which is about the performance of open source applications. I wish most people did their degree the way he did. So what we're doing this year is called 500 Lines or Less. And if you go to github.com slash AOSA book, that's the repo. We are getting a bunch of developers to write small versions of real applications. You're allowed at most 500 lines of code to build a web server, an OCR system, robot helicopter controls, whatever it is, to show people how the real one works. We've got a web server in about 200 lines of Python 2.7, sorry, Guido, 2.7, right, in order to show people how the real one works. I wrote it, and I'm really proud of the security holes in it because I want people to know what the real thing looks like. We've got text editors, we've got a whole bunch of things, and if you click on pull requests, you will see the 28 sections that are right in there that are looking for code review. And we just did a code review sprint that was brilliant because people are paired on the reviews and they're all shaking my hand on the way out saying that was really fun. I made a new friend and I got to read code, and boy, other people read code way differently than I do, okay? We're looking for contributions. We want to know 
both what you could build that we should show to a 20-year-old programmer who's trying to learn software design. She knows how to write code. She does not know how to design software because nobody's ever shown her what software design looks like. You get a chance to do that. You get 500 lines of code and 10 pages of text to go with it. We will edit it. We will help you. We will put it in front of other people who will help you become a better programmer and a better explainer, and then we can go out and conquer the world as we were meant to. Okay? <laughs> all of this is open access. It is all Creative Commons attribution license, so it is free to use. It is up on our website. The print edition is cost of production plus three bucks, and those three bucks go to Amnesty International, so you're helping a good cause while you're helping the next generation of software developers, and the only thing it doesn't do is take pounds off the waste which I wish it did. Now, no, we're still not done. The one other thing I would like you to do, and this is a completely separate topic, but I believe I have time. Tomorrow, there is a sprint. The guys from Scraping Hub and a bunch of others are organizing a sprint. Here's what we're gonna do, and I want you there. I want you to write little tiny web scrapers that go back through the internet archive and scrape the websites for conferences, PyCon, OSCON, the Ruby conference, Java One, going back as many years as we can to pull out the names of speakers that we can then run through the Python Natural Language Toolkit to do gender identification. And then we're gonna plot that graph. We're gonna see how the gender ratio at different conferences has changed over the last 15 years. That's gonna be a fun project, isn't it? So, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Check the open spaces. Thank you all. Thank you, Greg. So, uh, for, um, we have uh, on deck, we have Re Rebecca Standig, Standig, we have uh, Kirk Griffiths setting up over here, and uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Jeff Armstrong, who's going to talk to us about Windows. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, today I'm going to just give a quick talk on a little thing I've been working on, building CPython without using Visual Studio on Windows. Okay? So uh, let's just go a little bit into what CPython is. I'm talking about compiling actual core Python. Uh, in theory, core Python is just programmed in C using the C89 standard. So you would think it can just be compiled with just about anything, right? So if we actually look at the source code, what we have to do for CPython on Windows, uh, you can build with any supported compiler. And if you're on Windows, that's Microsoft's. So that's your supported compiler. But what else could we use? So, I mean, we have a few options on Windows, maybe not the best options. But let's just give a little summary here. Um, most people, if they say, I want to use an open source compiler on Windows, uh, I'm thinking of like the minimalist GNU for Windows uh, compiler uh, suite. There's a little bit, bit of a problem with trying to use that on Windows a lot of the time. It is a Unix compiler that they've shoehorned to be a native Windows compiler. So you run into some weird things where it doesn't like backslashes and random spots, or the runtime library isn't quite the same as Microsoft's. And it's kind of odd. The API for Windows sometimes isn't quite right. Um, uh, you could use SIGWIN, but that's not going to be a native compiler, and so the Python interpreter we build is going to have to run on top of that SIGWIN layer. We really want something that's native to Windows, just like we'd get with Visual Studio. We could use Borland, I guess. Uh, I'm trying to think of other Windows compilers here. Uh, I don't even know if you could still get that. Um, that's still closed source, though. So what does that leave us with? Well, it's going to leave us with a compiler called uh, OpenWatcom. I don't know if anybody out here has ever heard of the OpenWatcom compiler. All right, all right. It's probably most famous for being one of the only compi the only compiler left. I would uh, I would state that uh, still supports 16-bit uh, DOS and 32-bit DOS as one of its primary supported platforms. That's right, as well as OS2, Linux, Netware, and of course Windows. So let's go ahead and we'll give OpenWatcom a shot with. Uh, Python. Now, if you actually look at the core Python source code, it is riddled with uh, preprocessor definitions, trying to figure out what compiler you're using, what platform you're on. And when you go into that source code, you'll be surprised to find tons of preprocessor definitions that say if Watcom C is defined. So this, at some point, Python could actually be built with this straight out of the box. That must have been years ago, and I'm guessing it might have been Python for DOS. So, uh, 
Just as like a, a little overview of what we're dealing with when we look at some of the core Python code, this is a nice snippet that I've actually pulled out of the POSIX module, the C code, and you can see some of the nightmare of preprocessor definitions that are just living in the source code here. So you can see on the first line it says if defined Watcom C and not defined QNX. Apparently Watcom could target QNX platforms at some point. Uh, you can see then it's checking if you're using Borland, and then it finally checks if you're using Microsoft. So there's a lot of this kind of stuff in the uh, uh, core Python source code. And so I was trying to basically move around a lot of these preprocessor definitions so that open Watcom could build. And a lot of the issues surrounded um, the interchange of saying, oh, are we building with Microsoft Visual C? or are we building on the Microsoft Windows platform? A lot of the time, they were just used interchangeably, which isn't necessarily true. You could be using a different compiler. So I went ahead, I did some patching, and I actually built up a open Watcom project using the uh, stock Python 3.4 distribution. Uh, you can see here the open Watcom IDE. It's harkens back to Windows 3.1. I hope everybody enjoys this. But um, I assure you, after some minimal patches, I think my total patch file at this point is maybe 16, 60, or 16 or 20 kilobytes, something like that. It's in a source repository. I can go ahead and build this. Now, it's already pre-built, so we're not actually going to see if this works, but that would probably take a little bit too long. But anyway, if I go to my uh, DOS prompt here, and we'll just, uh, I've created a, uh, OW build directory in the Python source tree, and I can just fire up Python. And you can see we're actually running the Python interpreter natively on Windows without Visual Studio at this point. That's pretty cool, um, but it's a full suite, so we can import things like multiprocessing is here. Uh, we have uh, Async I.O. is all in here. It's all in here. There's still plenty of problems, but um, generally speaking, the regression tests fail at this point still, so we have to work on that a little bit more. Um, if you'd like to know more about this, my project that I'm using is called Lightning Python, and it's basically just a patch set. If you want to check it out, all the source code is on Bitbucket. If you go to the 3.4 branch, actual source code is there. Other, the uh, master branch is just going to be patch files. And um, if anybody wants to get in contact with me, uh, it's my information, and uh, go ahead and check it out. Thank you, Jeff. We have uh, Tom Ballinger on deck, and we have Rebecca Standig setting up over here. Uh, but at the moment, let's uh, put our hands together to welcome Jeff Armstrong from Austin, Texas. Well, Kurt, Gr Kurt. I apologize. Kurt Griffith from Austin, Texas. I don't know where Jeff Armstrong is from. <laughs> All right, uh, as the man said, I'm Kurt Griffiths. I am a cloud hacker at Rackspace. And um, I spend a lot of time thinking about web services and, and cloudy stuff, as you might imagine, and doing that at large scale. So today I'm going to give you a brief introduction to this framework called Falcon, which grew out of um, necessity at Rackspace from a project. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, Falcon, in a nutshell, is a tiny whiskey framework for writing web APIs. Now, I know there's somebody out there right now who's sort of thinking, um, <laughs> another one of these? Don't we have enough? Well, OK, um, let me tell you a little bit, of, uh, just a little story real quick. Um, my grandfather, uh, Evan Cotton, was a uh, master carpenter. And I observed something that he would do that, that's always stuck with me. He would take a project, and he would uh, look for the best tool he could find the, just the right tool for what he needed to do. And if that tool didn't exist, he would go create it. And um, uh, I really took that to heart, and I've tried to do that in my career, um, not trying to, uh, to use a cliched term, reinvent the wheel all the time, but sometimes that wheel needs to be reinvented. Um, so where Falcon came from was actually the, the seeds were planted in this internal project we were doing at, at Rackspace. We had to implement a REST API in Python. Uh, we needed it to have very low latency. Um, and 
extremely high throughput and be able to do that at large scale. And when you're doing this sort of thing at large scale, edge cases have a, have a tendency to not be so edge casey anymore. And so uh, when something breaks, you need to be able to get it back up and running. You need to be able to understand very quickly what's wrong with it. And so the code that you're writing has to be very predictable and, and readable and maintainable. So these were, this is what we were looking for. Um, we went and we cooked up, uh, oh wait, a slight digression. Um, <laughs> I said REST API a moment ago. Um, lots of different uh, terms. A lot, when, when, when you say REST, a lot of people think different things. But I think we can all agree that it's, it's an architectural style that embraces HTTP, uh, not tries to pave over it. So I am one, one, one of those people who believe that HTTP does not suck. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so we came up and we cooked this little framework called RAR, uh, just an, a little internal thing. It kind of embodied some of these concepts we wanted. Um, we. It came out, I mean, we, we took a survey of all the frameworks that were out there and we just couldn't find anything that was, that was gonna meet our needs. So we rolled our own, as people, coders do, um, and uh, started talking about it, started blogging about it. People encouraged me to, uh, let's, to uh, open source this. So we said, let's, let's get this out there. Let's get some other people working on it, looking at it. And uh, we came up with this experimental thing called Falcon. Um, and uh, since then, it's, been, it's about a year and a half old, and we have um, about 20 contributors now, and uh, it's sort of uh, ex uh, graduated from science project to actually being a real thing and, and something you can use in your projects. Now, um, if you're looking at this framework, um, uh, you might think, uh, you know, um, Falcon doesn't try to be a one-size-fits-all thing, so I'm going to tell you like some specific things that you might find it useful for. Falcon may be the right tool for you uh, when you want to run on all the things. It actually supports all these flavors of Python and, and, those, and both C, Python, and PyPy runtimes. Um, I haven't actually tested it on uh, Jython and all those guys, but um, if anyone wants to do that and report back, that'd be great. Okay, um, Falcon may be the right tool when you are building an API and you uh, don't, want to worry about all that, you're not actually serving web pages, you're serving um, um, respond and request calls, and you don't want to have to carry that baggage with you all the way across the country. Falcon may be the right tool when you think everything is awesome and you don't want someone to tell you which async library to use or which ORM to use or which whatever, to, which configuration library to use. So it leaves that all up to you and you get to choose your own adventure. Falcon may be the right tool when you like fast things. Now you may be thinking, um, why do I need to worry about my Python performance? We're almost out of time here. But it turns out that saving a few microseconds leads to um, some significant gains when you're serving a lot of concurrent requests. Okay, so um, we try very hard to be fast in, in Falcon. All right, and there's some code, Jeff, and go I check mean, that Kurt, out. I'm sorry, that's all the and time we have. And there we, we go. Have. Thank you. So we have um, Justin uh, Meyer uh, on deck, and we have Tom Ballinger setting up over here. Um, but before an intro, I wanted to talk to you about array indices. It's a really important topic, and I think one of the seminal uh, papers on it was uh, written by Dijkstra. Um, however, my favorite cartoonist, Randall Monroe, when he talked about array indices, he actually invoked Donald Knuth um, by having his comic about array indices where two people were discussing, should it be one-based or zero-based? And one of his characters said that actually when he asked Donald Knuth about that issue, Donald Knuth replied, who are you and what are you doing in my house? So, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce, uh, from the Bay Area, Rebecca Standig. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Rebecca Standig. It's like standing, but without the last N, like a typo. Um, <laughs> so, this lightning talk arose out of a discussion I had super late last night with a bunch of my friends, so I apologize for not having any visuals other than the mohawk. 
Um, <laughs> uh, it's entitled Inclusive, Inclusive Feminism, but the principles apply to pretty much any marginalized group. Um, these fundamentals come from my experiences as a member of a variety of different marginalized communities. I'm not gonna delineate them, but not just feminism. Um, so how can we be more inclusive as a community, but still maintain our ideals and work uh, constructively towards our goals? Um, principles for the leaders of marginalized communities. If you wanna be a leader, you need to be willing to engage with people with a variety of backgrounds who wanna help, but don't know how, or might be fumbling in their attempts to help. Doing Feminism 101 can be exhausting, but requiring a minimum level of education breeds exclusivity and is counterproductive. Communities like Python grow and diversify together, so we need to be able to speak out and recognize the importance of different voices together. You're under no obligation to exhaustively teach people the fundamentals like Feminism 101, but you should definitely not requ ignore requests for information and point them towards resources. You should be explicit in what you expect from your allies. How should they engage with you? In what capacity, how often, when, where, and what should they do if you need them to disengage? Implicit assumptions, such as people should know how you want to engage with them, everyone should know X, Y, and Z, or whatever, these all lead to a loss of potential allies and a righteous indignation at those who want to help but aren't in the know. Try not to assume intent if someone offends you. If they've made you or a friend feel uncomfortable or disrespected, the ideal situation is to communicate clearly with them what they've done and, if you wish, how they might be able to redeem themselves. I recognize this is a, a kind of a tiring and thankless task, so you're not under any obligation, but it's an ideal and it's pretty important to remember. Um, as a note, if you feel unsafe, obviously safety is the first priority, not telling someone what they did wrong. Um, remember that for many would-be allies, they're only just now realizing the issues you've been facing your entire life. This may be completely new to them, they may not have all of the salient historical details, so just be understanding and empathetic. Expect some faux pas and be willing to forgive them. Now for allies and wannabe allies, first and foremost, do your research. I wrote that in all caps up here. It's the most important thing you can do. Having to explain Feminism 101 or whatever 101 is extraordinarily frustrating and time consuming. So do your research and people will be so much happier. No white knighting. This is your chance to sidekick. Don't assume that you know how to help, that we inherently want your help or even need it. Understand that the majority of questions that are posed to leaders of marginalized communities are inflammatory, argumentative, uneducated, and or bigoted. You may not be any of these things, in fact, you're probably not if you want to be an ally, but understand that for many, this is the unfortunate norm. If you have any indication that you've made someone uncomfortable, the best thing to do is just apologize, step back, and give them space. Asserting yourself and what you believe to be your good intentions can be equally or nearly as threatening as someone who has bad intentions. Um, and on that note, be aware that what you may view as support might not be received as such. Make sure you're not overstepping boundaries in an attempt to help. If you have to ask, would it be offensive if I blah, then you, you shouldn't do it. When in doubt, just don't do it. Um, and in closing, as Steve Holden said in a Twitter conversation right before this talk, weirdly, uh, most of all, goodwill on both sides and a desire to do better are required. So my name is Rebecca Standig. You can find me on Twitter at understandig, like understanding without the last N. Um, I'd love to talk to you about creating inclusive communities, linguistics, that was my original career, um, data science, Keen IO, Hackbright, Rugby, and Python. Thank you, Rebecca. So um, on deck, we have uh, Andrew Francis, and setting up over here, we have Justin Meyer. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Ballinger. Cool. Hi, I'm Tom Ballinger, and I am terrifically, heart-poundingly excited to talk to you today about um, BPython and some possible futures for it. Um, first, a little subliminal messaging, and then um, for IPython, it turns out, is terrific. And it's hard to talk about BPython without um, kind of standing in the shadow of IPython, because IPython is so terrific. Um, and if there's a thing that you're wondering if maybe BPython can do that you know IPython can do, the answer is probably no, just to, just to answer it right now. But there are some neat things that BPython can do. And if you're, using, if you're just using pure Python at the interpreter, you go to your interpreter, you type you know, your command line, you type Python, you can be doing it better. Um, and I won't talk about IPython. Well, I'll come back to it, because it's exciting. Um, first, vPython is terrifically exciting. Um, if we're here and we type vPython um, and we do something like this, we can see, oh, we have syntax highlighting. That's really exciting. And I want to explore what methods S has. Uh, 
cool, I, the center, I don't really know anything about that. How is that? Oh, cool. So I have to type a width. And then I can say what fill character I want. That's kind of cool. So this is a great way to be exploring um, libraries, that see what method something has. Um, we can do fun things like write a little class here. I'm going to write you know, a little init here. And uh, maybe we'll just take an x and y. And then I'll need self. Oh, shoot. So I forgot self. Um, I forgot to forget self at first. But then I forgot self. And so now what we're going to do in bpython is rewind a line and go back, which is exciting because we couldn't do that in normal Python. And now we can say something like def init of self and x and go on and do this stuff. So, so vPython is exciting. And if you're not using something nicer than this, oh, that's no good, but we can go back and fix it again. Self.x is equal to x and, and go on and go on our merry way. Um, so, so that's exciting. And it's, it really helps the exploration process to have this kind of immediate in your face tab completion um, and documentation. Um, we've got a few other things like this. You know, we can save this to a file, which is kind of fun. We can paste bin this with Control Eight and you, or Function Eight, and then you can customize where you paste this to. And I like kind of doing this, so we can jump over here and look at our you know, whatever, wherever you want to paste bin in. That's kind of neat. Um, and then we're back here to um, what we've got. And. So, but the scrolling in bPython is broken. And I investigated this a while ago and was trying to figure out how to go about. So when we're in bPython, it takes over the screen. We do stuff. If we go too far down, we can't scroll back. Um, we don't see our history from what we were doing before bPython. At the end, it prints it all out. So it's as though you had it the whole time, but we wanted to do better. Um, and I was explaining to someone why this is impossible. and We couldn't possibly do it a while ago. Um, and that led to me creating a little a repo here called uh, Scott was right, because Scott turns out was right. This is possible. And that turned into a kind of curses replacement called uh, curtsies. And there were about an, it was about an, an hour or two where I thought maybe I could throw it away and use Eric Rose's blessings, which is terrific, but I can't quite because it's lacking, missing some things. So bPython curtsies is fun because it works just like the normal Python interpreter. We do stuff, and then we're right back out of it. Um, it's in master now, and you can download the kind of default bPython and install it and use bPython curtsies instead, um, as a few other neato things, like I can have a, a 10 here, foo, do stuff with A. <laughs> and then we could kind of throw this over to Vim here and modify it, and like, ah, that should have been you know, 12, and, and this should have been this, and that should have been A, so we can see an effect. And oh, cool, that it still didn't work. But live coding is kind of a bad idea. So, <laughs> um, so that's neat. Some neat features like this, and the native script. This is some other, you know, other fun things here. Uh, these were other things that we kind of tried. Ended up with bPython curtsies. This is in master now. Um, you should try it out. Other oh, fun features it has. Um, but if you didn't see that slide, um, it would still be really cool to have all those features of bPython and iPython combined. BPython, or iPython has really cool stuff, like turning on debugger mode, where when an exception is raised, you get stuck in a debugger right where it was. You can do you know, cool stuff like run shell commands right from there. So wouldn't it be neat if you could figure out how to combine these two? And uh, Paul Ivanov, one of the core iPython folks, is starting to do this. Um, if you're kind of come up with a name for iPython on bPython, together. You could call it like IPython, BPython, or BPython, IPython. Um, but geniusly, he told me he was going to do this last year at PyCon, and he's finally um, getting to it, which is BiPython. And it's, in, it's, not, it's not there yet, but it's happening. And so I just want to alert everyone that it exists. It's very exciting. And if you look here, he's gone through you know, starting to do by Python, it's going to be great because you shouldn't have to choose. So just PSA, this is coming. We'd love your help. That's all. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, Olga on deck. We have Andrew Francis setting up right here. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce, or please put your hands together for Justin Meyer. My name is Justin Mayer. I work on web applications at Strata Labs, a soon to be launched project called Nonprofit HQ, and a static site generator called Pelican. And today I'm going to talk about static site generators. But we can't talk about static site generators without first talking about how the web was started. Sometime in the mid 1990s, humankind began coding HTML pages by hand. For those that may not know, the first websites consisted of content mixed in with HTML tags. Headers and footers were copy-paste duplicated across every page on the site. 
and by and large, only technical folks published things. These problems were often solved by separating content from markup and storing the content in a database, putting logic on the server to generate HTML on the fly via templates, and adding a web interface to allow non-technical users to make changes. And thus, the Content Management System, or CMS, was born. These improvements came with several costs. In addition to Apache or Nginx, now we must install and maintain an application server and a database server. Content is no longer just a bunch of files, so content versioning is harder. What if a high-profile site links to you? Congratulations, your server just caught fire and died. Or perhaps your WordPress instance has a security vulnerability and just got hacked. In either case, you're going to have a bad day. Static site generators were conceived to solve many of the same problems as the CMS, but without many of the downsides. Content is written in a simple markup, such as Markdown, restructured text, ASCII doc, and a number of others. Templating systems allow for content blocks, so there's no repetition. And the content is just a bunch of files, so they're easily versioned and easily backed up. Because there's no application server or database server, there are less moving parts and less things to go wrong. The site is usually faster as well, since you're not waiting on the CPU to generate the page. Your source content is sitting on your computer instead of a database on a remote server somewhere, so you have more control over your own data. And deployment is dead simple. Because the site is just HTML, CSS, and maybe some JavaScript, it opens up a ton of deployment options. Personally, I use a single Fabric command to generate the site and rsync it to a tiny virtualized server running Nginx. If you don't want to pay for a VPS, you can publish to GitHub pages for free. There's S3, Heroku, Rackspace Cloud, and many other choices as well. So a little bit about Pelican itself. There are quite literally hundreds of static site generators, of which Pelican is simply one. That said, it seems to be quite popular and is used by an increasingly diverse community, including the Linux kernel, Debian, and countless other individuals and organizations. Static site generators are, of course, not a match for all use cases. If you want to be able to say, show me all large t-shirts in blue, you're probably going to need a database of some kind. Another potential issue is generation time, for large sites anyway. Because we're generating everything up front instead of each page on demand, sites with a massive number of pages can take a while to generate. My tests on an actual site with thousands of pages averaged about 30 seconds to generate, which seems reasonable to me, but may not be acceptable for everyone. Other downsides include limited interactive capability and some room for improvement when it comes to user friendliness. Thankfully, members of the community have stepped forward to address a lot of these shortcomings. Recent improvements include content caching and parallel I.O., significantly reducing generation times for large sites. Other folks have added site search, web-based editing, and self-hosted commenting. As an example, Michael Lusfield wanted folks to be able to search his site in a self-contained way that keeps his data under his control. So he built his own search service, uh, microservice, powered by Sphinx and Bottle. Federico Chirado wanted to create and edit pages from any device, so he built his own web editor, a simple bottle app called Shoebill, and shared it with the community. This is what it looks like. This is Nonprofit HQ's pre-launch page, which is a static site built with Pelican. The form connects via JavaScript to a very, very simple Flask application that I wrote. This application receives the email address via the JavaScript, connects to MailChimp's API, and then sends it off to, uh, to add to the launch notification list. Static page, tiny Flask application, and no database, or any other infrastructure. So static site generators are being used to address an increasingly large number of use cases due to their simplicity, speed, and reliability. And they also pair well with the growing trend towards microservices. Thanks for listening. And please reach out if you want to join the Pelican Sprint tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you, Justin Mayer. Um, OK, so on deck, we have, uh, oh, sorry, uh, on deck we have Fletcher uh, Helscher. And I'd like if um, setting up over here, kind of next to the stage, we could have the organizers of some regional PyCons. We have uh, Mike Mueller, Andy Dernberger, Brian Koslow, and Clinton Roy, please, uh, by the side of the stage here. Uh, but right now, I'm excited to uh, introduce you to, uh, or many of you, I'm sure, know uh, Olga Botvinnik. Hi, everyone. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Olga Botvinik. Um, I'm Olga Bot on Twitter. The sli these slides are available. Um, I just tweeted them, Olga Bot on Twitter, also on Bitly at this link, also this Git repo. So there's three ways to do it. Maybe that's not bad. Uh, so I really love data visualization. Um, last year, I released this library called Pretty Plotlib, which is essentially a wrapper around Matplotlib and has nice defaults based on Color Brewer, Cynthia Brewer's Color Brewer uh, color concepts, and uh, Tufti's, uh, Edward Tufti's ideas about um, data understanding. It has some same defaults. Um, but Matplotlib is great if you have some data and you just want to plot the data. But what if you want to compute some stuff on the data and then plot that computation? That's where the Seaborn plotting library comes in. Um, and this has been an awesome library. It's uh, written primarily by Michael Wascom at Stanford. And you can uh, check out the gallery. It has a lot of awesome, awesome uh, examples. I'm going to talk about a couple of them. First one, uh, first let's make some data. I made the data frame apple and banana. Um, one is floats, the other is ints. That can be interesting in the future. Uh, so if we plot them, we can see the distribution. Um, so uh, what's interesting is I've actually already imported the Seaborn library. Uh, and this is slightly different from the MatPolib defaults. Um, and again, this is, you get from you, when you change import Seaborn, it changes your imports right away. So by default, it's this gray grid. I did this a little out of order in the Python notebook. Um, so I prefer a more white. Uh, white background, no gray background, and um, white grid, as I did in Pretty Plotlib. Um, and so if you set, you can set this context and change it for a talk so that your, uh, your x tech labels and such are bigger. Since it's still with, with pandas, you have this grid. So first, let's talk about what if we want to plot a scatter plot, A versus B. This is something pretty standard. Scatter, plot scatter, apple, and banana. So this is the two ways you can access columns and uh, pandas. That's pretty cool, but what if we want to make a histogram of the two data points in addition to the scatter plot, kind of like this, this is done in R very commonly. Also, this is built in into MATLAB with scatter hist, but we don't want to use MATLAB, we want to use Python. So there's a bunch of code you have to write, a bunch of setup, especially of this crazy layout with um, Matplotlib. Um, don't get me wrong, Matplotlib is amazing, um, but there's a lot of setup code you have to do. Um, and if we want to add something like a Pearson correlation score, we need to add uh, we need to add some more code. And then we plot this in this like weird place, and nobody can read it. It's a little too small. Next, that seems like a lot of work. So what Seaborn does is it does this, uh, gr this scatter hist sanely with one line in joint plot. It gets even better. You can do a regression line if you just add kind equals reg to this. There's plenty more uh, A versus B you can do. Uh, a kernel density estimate plot. Notice that if you do this KDE plot, you s when you look at um, apple versus banana, remember banana was, was all discrete data, so you get kind of stripey uh, output. You don't see that in KDE plot. So that's something to maybe think about when you're visualizing your data, if it's ints versus floats. Uh, another thing you can do in a hex bin uh, plot. Uh, and there's even more. So, But one thing I do want to mention with Seaborn, it doesn't return a figure uh, because uh, it would do show two, two figures in IPython. So if you need to save it, make sure to do plot.gcf to get the current figure instance in uh, matplotlib. That's something that tripped me up for a bit. Um, that's cool, but what about the distribution of those, these two data points relative to each other? You can do a block, box plot. It's kind of ugly. Uh, we can do Seaborn's box plot. And notice that, that this was built in with pandas in mind. So apple and banana, the two categories we have, are already labeled. Something I use a lot is a violin plot. And you can see these uh, dotted lines, uh, the line dashed lines, is the, uh, qu and the dotted lines are the quartiles, so 50%, the median, and the 75.25. Um, you can also do this in pure matplotlib. I tried pulling out some code that I found from like, my old code, and you can see it doesn't look any good, and it takes a lot of code. Um, so it's not even close to what Seaborn does, and it's already a lot more code than I ever want to write. So back to Seaborn, there's more violin plot styles. You can do inner points. Um, and I really like that. We have a lot of data points. It looks almost like a line, but it can be useful if you have fewer things. Um, cool. So if this wasn't enough data viz for you, you can check out the Seaborn repo, uh, contribute to it. I think it's awesome. Um, also the documentation, and here's how you can contact me. And here's a quick 
a preview of what's to come in Seaborn, this clustered heat map that people use a lot in R in Python. And that's my timer. Thank you, Olga, for a great talk and your uh, extreme flexibility in, in scheduling. Thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to welcome uh, the f four organizers of uh, regional PyCons uh, to uh, just, uh, well, four of the many regional PyCons uh, to come and uh, speak to us about their uh, PyCons. So it looks like we're up. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, Mike Mueller, who is the uh, chairman of EuroPyCon. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So if you enjoy Python conferences and you don't mind for a little bit warmer weather, then I invite you to come to Berlin this summer on July 21st to enjoy uh, EuroPython 2014. Uh, we will have about 1,200 people coming to the conference. We will have a lot of talks. There's real submissions for talks. The talks are through. If you would like to submit, so a poster, there are still some openings to submit a poster. We do offer financial aid, so if you think you need some financial aid, you can apply and you might get some financial aid to come over to, to Germany. Please come. If you're a sponsor and you like to, to sponsor Python conferences, we still have slots for sponsors, you will get a booth. Very similar setup to here, so come out and reach to the European Python community. Uh, please go to the link to see for more information. And also, before I forget, also embedded in the conference, we have the PyData conference, which will be 26th and 27th of July. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Andy Dernberger, who is the organizer of PyGotham. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Andy Dernberger. I'm one of the organizers of PyGotham. Uh, we're bringing it back this year on uh, the weekend of August 15th and 16th. The CFP opens on May 15th, uh, so watch out for that. Uh, and you can get more information by going to pygotham.org. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Coslow, uh, chair of Pi Ohio. Hey, so, you know, it's funny, it's Pi Ohio 2014, but it's not really Ohio anymore. Um, it's now grown to be a regional conference for really the entire Midwest and Great Lakes region. Um, we're gonna be doing between 32 and 40 talks and tutorials this year. We expect about 400 attendees. Barbara Charette will be coming up to do a Young Coders on Saturday. Uh, we're working on getting a second class for Sunday. And the price for all of this is absolutely free. Pi Ohio is free to attend. Um, so, call for proposals is open right now. Um, officially, it was gonna close May 1st, but because a lot of people have said, hey, I'm at PyCon, I don't have time to finish, we're gonna send that to the 15th. I, if I remember right from the opening remarks, there were something like um, 500 talks that did not get accepted for PyCon, mostly for space reasons. Please submit them to us. Um, if you're a new speaker, we're a great venue. We provide mentorship for people to help do talks. Um, it's a smaller venue, it's a little less intimidating, and selecting people who have never spoken before is actually part of our uh, selection process. Um, in fact, Tavi Burns and Alex Gaynor both gave their first Python talks at Pi Ohio. So um, please come join us. If you are speaking, there is, uh, Pi Ohio does not give financial aid, but we can match you up with some limited financial aid from other people if you need to cover travel expenses. So uh, start submitting, thanks. Thank you, I'd like to introduce uh, Clinton Roy, the chair of PyCon AU. Hi everyone. Um, I'm the uh, head organizer of PyCon Australia. Uh, our call for proposals is currently open. Uh, we're also interested in hearing from uh, some more sponsors. The conference is in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. It's a free pronunciation guide for you. It's in the first week of August. It's the best uh, weather uh, in Brisbane at that time. It's not warm, uh, sorry, it's not hot, it's warm, it's mild, um, which you might like after this week. Um, we have all of the typical events that you'd uh, hope for and expect for at uh, a PyCon. Um, I'm around for all of the sprints this week, so come and find me if you've got any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you to the uh, organizers of all the regional PyCons who uh, spoke here today, as well as the uh, meetup organizers and other Python organizers throughout the community. 
Um, now I'd like to uh, mention that uh, Remy is on deck. Nathan Yergler can be uh, setting up over here. And uh, please put your hands together for uh, Fletcher Helscher. Hi, everyone. I'm Fletcher Heisler. Uh, I'm here from Washington, DC, where I work at a tech startup called TrackMaven. Um, how many of you have had to write code that relies in some way on accessing an external API? Most of you. Out of those, how many times has that gone perfectly according to the fully documented everything for the life of the project? Yeah. So. Uh, at TrackMaven, we're dealing with a competitive intelligence platform for marketers. Uh, essentially, we're building a Django app that relies on dozens of these APIs of varying degrees of quality. Uh, and so I want to talk to you about maintaining a peace of mind while you uh, explore some of these possible gotchas uh, in dealing with real-world APIs. Uh, first of all, rate limits, besides obviously respecting any bursting uh, requirements that an API gives you, take a look at daily limits. Uh, so if your service or product that you're making 200 requests a day out of uh, hits the top of Hacker News and suddenly you're making 200,000 requests a day, you won't be hitting a brick wall and not be able to scale anymore. On the other hand, if you're using a free small beta service and they didn't really think to include any rate limits, that doesn't mean it's free game. You might accidentally take down their service with a uh, friendly DOS if you uh, aren't access accessing them in a responsible way. Uh, error codes, obviously go through the documentation, gather up any possible error codes and plan for them ahead of time. Uh, but then be creative in your requests, try things out, see if you can get any more errors to come up before they happen in production. Uh, in a, a similar vein, we realized uh, recently that we weren't getting any data out of a particular service uh, because they had deauth our credentials, uh, but they were returning a you know, response 200 OK, you've been deauthed, you get no data. So plan for all of those eventualities. Uh, restfulness, uh, you know, every API has some quirks, so especially if you're building a custom client from scratch, plan all the way to those uh, little corners before they uh, they come back and bite your code. And finally, uptime. You can't always guarantee that you're going to get uh, the data when you first and absolutely want it at that moment. Uh, so plan for possible downtime. Now, what can you do about these potential quirks? Well, first of all, an initial audit. You should take a look at an API in all of these uh, uh, different aspects before you dive in and, and try to build a service around it. Uh, testing. Obviously, you should test the APIs. Uh, whenever we build, we test to see if uh, services have changed, if endpoints have changed. Uh, but just as importantly, you should be separating that code so that uh, your builds don't depend in their success on other people's services. Uh, so mock all of that out where possible. Forgive and retry. Uh, we have tons of celery tasks that initially, if we uh, had missed data and something had gone down temporarily, uh, we would be just out of luck and not be able to collect that. So plan for some possible downtime. Plan for those schedules as much as possible. Uh, notifications. We have webhooks in HipChat so that if we're getting more errors than usual, uh, we'll be able to see ahead of time uh, what might be going down or where we might want to investigate. Uh, we also throw all of our task events in Logly so that we can uh, check afterward for those four hours a day that we're not watching HipChat what might have gone wrong. And finally, track. You should have some sort of data dashboard if you're collecting lots of ongoing data uh, to make sure that you're seeing trends over time uh, so that you don't have any uh, nasty surprises later. Thanks so much. Thank you, Fletcher. Um, OK, so actually, um, I'd like to have uh, Andrew Francis uh, setting up here. Remy is uh, still on deck. And um, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Nathan Yergler. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking to you about a program I've written over the past couple years called Hieroglyph. Uh, it lets you build beautiful slides from plain text. Over the past three years, I've had the privilege of doing a lot of different pre presentations. I did something about Django Forms. I've done this thing about Python 3 and my failed attempt to run Eventbrite on it. Hilarious. Um, I did some this, this speaking in tongues thing about localization and something about writing tests for existing legacy code. And because, oh, and finally I did a PDB talk, which uh, I had a lot of fun putting together, and it uses the newest version of Hieroglyph. 
everybody knows it's more fun to write a program, to help you write a program, than it is to actually write a program. And so, with that in mind, um, I try to make it a point every year when I'm giving a talk, or every time I give a talk, to write some piece of software to help me with it, because, of course, it's more fun to write a program to help you write a talk than it is to actually write a talk. So, um, that has become Hieroglyph. Uh, Hieroglyph builds slides from plain text using Sphinx, which means you get to utilize the whole rich community of Sphinx extensions for adding things like block diagrams, um, syntax highlighting, all that sort of great stuff. And it has this nice side effect that you can write one file and generate multiple formats from it, which I'll show in just a moment. But why would you want to do that? Well, I have a plain text problem. Um, and I have an Emacs problem, and this is really just a cunning way for me to uh, feed both of those problems while telling myself I'm being productive and writing more software. So, uh, and I also write documentation in Sphinx, and this is a way to then present it to other people. Um, so, it's, Hieroglyph is quite easy to use. Uh, you can pip install, and as Ashish pointed out yesterday, you should install with dash dash user. And then there's a Hieroglyph clicks. Hieroglyph Quick Start script, which is very similar to the Sphinx Quick Start, except it uh, adds the extension for you automatically. And when you're done, you can simply make slides. If you have an existing project, you simply add it to the uh, extensions, and it's available as a builder. When you write your document, headings simply become uh, slides, and you can, there's additional directives you can use for sort of controlling things, but really you can usually just start writing and get something that looks like a plausible first draft. Um, there's CSS, of course. And this is an example from my PDB um, talk of some source code where I have a section, PDB 101, and I have a little bit of content in there that is only going to show up when I'm not building slides. There's some literal includes. Um, all this is to show you that you can write it once, and um, I can get documentation out of this. So this is the HTML that I generate that I can send um, to my colleagues. And I can also get slides, and this is the slide that generated out of this, complete with the little highlighting and the arrows and all that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to be sprinting Monday and Tuesday um, on finishing up an update to the base HTML on this, some more comprehensive documentation. And I'm going to attempt to figure out how to do PDF export, because that seems to be the thing everybody asks for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. We have um, uh, on, on deck, we have, uh, or setting up over here, we have uh, our last lightning speaker, Remy. Um, also, I wanted to ask uh, Fernando Perez to uh, meet me at the side of the stage um, for a moment. And um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Andrew Francis, who's going to talk to us about solving a problem like Santa Claus with Python. Hello, my name is Andrew Francis, and it's a great pleasure to give a talk in my hometown of Montreal. This is a notorious problem in computer science. You've made, uh, I should say, a notorious concurrency problem in computer science. I first encountered it in the book Beautiful Code. The solution was given in Haskell, and I said to myself, gee, can I create a Pythonic version of this? The main problem is there seems to be an impedance mismatch between how we see a problem, which is essentially we wait for either nine reindeer to, to arrive or any group of three elves out of Santa's numerous elves. And in case of a, both the reindeer and the elves arrive at the same time, I'll, the, the uh, reindeer get priority. So this seems to be conceptually simple, but you get things like this. I took this from a really nice little book called um, the book of the book of little the little book of semaphores by Tom Downey, and you can see that it's that the solution is really low level. And I and I basically try to figure out what what would a high what would it look at a higher level. And I decided I eventually got something like this. So I worked with something called Stackless Python, which has cha synchronous channels, very easy to use. So in this little solution, what happens is you wait for either one or two, what the select does, it waits for one or two patterns to finish. Don't worry right now what a pattern is. If it's an elf pattern, we have to check if reindeer are ready. Otherwise, we basically do what that big blurb said that would take 10 minutes to read. And just a little bit more to show that this thing 
has very Pythonic features, like you can iterate over a pattern. There's a little problem here. In reality, stackless Python does not have a select statement. It comes from Go. Nor does it have join patterns. This comes from polyphonic C. This is an example that actually does the dining philosophers. But you know, it's no problem. At the end of the day, with, with, with stackless PY, which is an implementation of stackless Python written in Python, it's quite easy to prototype. You pull out your, your paper, you know, you analyze it, you, and, and you're, you're good to go, and you don't have to know C to, to explore things. For example, this algorithm here, we basically, a friend and I, we, we looked at the Plan 9 code for the select algorithm, and we implemented it in about 150 lines of Python. And most of that was for a doubly linked list, and I don't know why we use a doubly linked list. Anyway, to, to finish off, um, I was just really, really intrigued by the notion of experimental prototyping. And a long time ago, I remember reading this paper by, by Milton and Dietrich, and they have this little line. And they were ta although they're talking about small talk, it really applies to Python. It's really great that you can basically prototype a, a concurrency construct. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was fantastic. OK, um, I wanted to, uh, Python, we know, is about community. And I wanted to make an announcement on behalf of the scientific Python community. Um, so um, just about some upcoming conferences that they have going on, uh, and that obviously we are all invited to. Uh, SciPy 2014 in Austin, Texas in July. EuroPy 2014 in Cambridge, UK in August, SciPy Argentina in September, and SciPy India is to be announced. Um, next, um, on the subject of science, and uh, I came to Python via physics, um, I wanted to talk to you about physics a little bit uh, in my typical fashion. Um, so there's a story that goes back to when uh, Schrodinger and Heisenberg were lost in conversation discussing the finer points of quantum mechanics. And um, they were so lost in conversation driving down the freeway that Heisenberg didn't even notice in his rearview mirror that there were lights behind him flashing. Well, he, he pulled over and the police officer walked over to him and asked him to roll down the window. The police officer said as he might, um, do you know how fast you were going? Well, Heisenberg said, no, officer, I don't, but I know exactly where I am. There, there's more. There's a lot more, actually. So um, the police officer says to him, um, well, you were going exactly 80 miles an hour. So then uh, Heisenberg goes, thank you. Now I have no idea where I am. Well, the police officer's dog is getting a little uh, frisky at this point and like going all around the car and bar barking and pawing at the trunk. So the police officer walks back to the trunk and goes, excuse me, uh, m uh, Mr. Schrodinger, uh, do you mind if I check inside your trunk? Schrodinger goes, o officer, um, I'd prefer if you did not. Um, police officer ignores him. He opens the trunk and goes, ugh, did you know there's a dead cat back there? Schrodinger goes, it is now. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce our final lightning speaker of PyCon 2014, Remy D. Cosmaker. Mm. Salud, PyCon. So, uh, my name is Remedy Cosmaker, and like most of you, I wear many hats. I was a GSOC mentor this summer for Sugar Labs. I'm the resident academic and open sourcer in the RIT Center for Media, Arts, Games, Interaction, and Creativity, or MAGIC for short. I'm a community organizer for a number of meetups like the OLPC, Python, Tech Startups, and our Hacks and Hackers chapter in Rochester. And currently, a new hat I started wearing this year was Professor. 
Uh, I actually teach a course called uh, Humanitarian Free and Open Source Software Development and an advanced projects course where we do five week release cycles on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we're going to be doing some course development in business and legal environment and possibly even some 3D printing on the Lulzbot with Python uh, next year. So if you know stuff about that, uh, patches are welcome. <laughs> Uh, there's a number of avenues for engagement with the program, and I've mentioned it here at PyCon a number of times. All of you have been growing with us at RIT, and we're really thankful for the opportunity for our students to engage with the Python conference uh, through social coding events like this, as well as boot camps and hackathons and meetups. Uh, we have a number of ways that our students contribute, like volunteering, getting jobs, doing contract work, independent studies where they get credit for continuing on their research, part-time work, undergraduate research in Google Summer of Code. And now, announcing uh, the first academic minor in free and open source software and free culture at a university in the United States. Uh, Got to shout out Corey, that's actually his title that he put up. Um, so uh, the required courses, we have the HFOS course, which I'll talk more about in a second, the legal course, and the free and open culture. Uh, and then you get to pick either Linux systems or technical writing. And then we have a buffet of electives in all the different colleges where if you're using FOSS in the program, uh, you have to do some kind of capstone-like project to get credit. And the reason why this is interesting is because it's a interdisciplinary minor, meaning that you can take it as a computing major or as a non-technical major, because we all know that we could use better design and better documentation in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of FOSS projects. So the HFOSS course, which is the gateway to this course, uh, this minor rather, uh, there's some cool things about it. Um, it's open courseware, it's up on GitHub, it's Flask with Bootstrap and Mako on the front using Python cartridges running on Red Hat's OpenShift cloud. Uh, it's open content, meaning everything's CC by SA and everything's on GitHub. Uh, the course mechanics that I like, uh, attendance is taken in IRC with SoupyBot, uh, blogs are tracked with web scrapers, and students are turning in their assignments via pull requests and patches. Um, it's kind of like a hacker course, right? So uh, the final project is to develop an educational game based on the fourth grade math curriculum in New York and Massachusetts to be released on the Exo laptop of one laptop per child, which I've mentioned here in previous lightning talks. We had over 50,000 downloads in 2011. Uh, this is the deployment heat map of all the Exos all over the world. Contrary to the rumors, the project is not dead. Um, Sugar Labs lives and there's over 600,000 that form the backbone of Uruguay's public education system that are deployed there and all over the rest of the world. So this is what the grading looks like. Basically, um, it turns out that if you're doing stuff like committing early and often, being available in IRC, doing your readings, and you know the regular stuff you do in class, you get credit. But if you're doing things like writing bots that make you available for attendance, I think you deserve credit. If you're digging into the source code to cheat and look at the answers on the quizzes, that's great. If you're finding other people's blogs from last year, that means you're doing your homework, right? There's also an open uh, requirement that in the intro course, you have to do one bug fix every semester where you go on, find an issue, try and close the ticket, you get graded on your blog post, and if the issue is accepted or your patch is accepted upstream, you get extra credit, and there's no cap. So I have students already that have like seven or eight patches in various projects, and they're totally gaming the system, like good students should be. So the cycle is basically these courses create projects, the projects create scholarship opportunities, which gives the students a chance to get involved and do internships and work study, which then gets them jobs and hopefully they come back to mentor the next round of students. We try to create a nice life cycle and lots of people in the audience are hanging out in IRC with us and mentoring our students and helping them along the way. I'm gonna go through this really quickly because these are the modules of the course. Basically set up your blog, IRC and Git, read about what is FOSS, do a ComArch assignment, read about curriculum, do project planning, have some development, play test with fourth graders, and then give your final presentation. Thank you to the PyCon organizers, volunteers, and hackers. These are all the different ways you can get a hold of us. Thanks to the Center for Magic, IGM department, where I'm teaching, uh, the FOSSBOX folks, the students thank who are you. here with us. Thank you, Remy. And thank you. Okay, I just want to say thank you to Nilovna, 
Lynn Root, my fellow co-hosts and organizers for Lightning Talks. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers. You have been just a pleasure, every one of you to work with. Um, and your talks were amazing, fantastic, brilliant. Um, and of course, I want to thank all of you, our community. So while it may be true that for some of us, uh, PyCon is ending. For others, PyCon is just beginning. This is, I mean, this is what people come here to, to find projects, to find groups, to learn how to hack on projects. So please, for the sprints, I'd like the sprint leaders to come to the front here, please. Um,